We have a list of the top 10 potential free agents at CBSSports.com. Harden is number one with that player option, followed by Zach Levine, who is unrestricted. The only other unrestricted free agent on this list is Jalen Brunson, who comes in at number eight. Many of the other guys either restricted or with player options for next season. Let's bring in a couple of our NBA experts, Bill Ryder and Colin Ward Henniger. And let's start with DeAndre Ayton, Bill. He is a restricted free agent, but things really unraveled there toward the end of this season in Phoenix. What happens with him? Yeah, you said it, Chris. Unraveled with that organization and really even before that unraveled in that relationship between DeAndre Ayton and the Phoenix Suns. There's certainly a scenario where the Suns do whatever they have to do to pay him and keep him, but that would take them into some dangerous, at least from their perspective, tax territory. And as I understand it, talking to sources, and this isn't a secret, everyone in the NBA knows this, DeAndre Ayton does not and did not feel valued by that organization. So teams that are willing to pay him and see a lot of upside, especially offensively, include the Spurs, include the Magic, and for me, if I were betting on this, I think the Detroit Pistons make a lot of sense as an organization that is bereft of the kind of talent that they want outside of Cade Cunningham that feels like they're building something for the long term. Aiton's still a young guy in the right situation with the right offensive talent around him. There's a sense, not universal, but from a lot of folks around the NBA that he can be a great player consistently. He's going to get paid somewhere. And for me, it's Detroit, but I certainly think it'll be somewhere most likely other than Phoenix. Yeah, for me, I mean, I think the best decision DeAndre could make from a basketball perspective is going back to Phoenix, kind of mending whatever fences need to be mended there so that uh, that team can continue to compete for championships. But if I'm looking at DeAndre Ayton, the human being, the guy who's the number one pick, a guy who reportedly feels undervalued by the franchise, who doesn't just want to be a guy who sets screens and rolls and does the little things and plays defense, uh, a team like, you know, all the teams that Bill mentioned are certainly in play. Another team that's reportedly got interest is the Portland Trailblazers. And to me, that makes a lot of sense. That would give Ayton the opportunity to go there and be the number two next to Damian Lillard, get to showcase his skills. And for Portland, they're looking for a guy who they can bring in and give Damian Lillard some hope. Say, hey, look, our franchise is headed in the right direction. We're headed back to the postseason, back to contention. And Aiton, I think, is a guy that can do that. So for me, uh, you know, basketball-wise, it might make most sense for DeAndre Aiton to go back to Phoenix. Uh, but as a human being, as a basketball player, as a guy who wants to show everyone what he's capable of on a big stage, I think that Portland is actually a team that makes a lot of sense for DeAndre Ayton. Colin says the Blazers are the best landing spot. Bill says the Pistons are the best landing spot. Uh, Bill, what would the Suns do? What would, where would they go from here with an aging Chris Paul, a season in which they had the best record in the NBA and then flamed out in the postseason? If it's not DeAndre Ayton, where do you go? Yeah, I mean, talking to the folks in that organization, I think there's a disconnect between how they value DeAndre Ayton, how they think DeAndre Ayton should val value the Phoenix Suns, and how he'll be valued by the rest of the league. And, and Colin hit on that. There is still, as I understand it, a hope within that Suns organization that Ayton will see the progress he has made. And let's give Chris Paul credit, certainly the people within the Suns hierarchy do, for helping Ayton become the guy that's lived up somewhat to that number one overall draft pick billing. So their plan is DeAndre Ayton, and, and there's a sense that they they think they can convince him to remain and to be there. If he's not there, there's not a lot of choices out there for centers you can go get. I mean, Bobby Portis Jr. is a guy that would be an option if he's not in Milwaukee. Dwight Howard's not anyone at the top of anyone's list, but that's someone that, whose name has been tossed around as an affordable option. But as I understand it, the Phoenix Suns really hope and think DeAndre Ayton should look at the success they've had on the court, should understand there's a window right now as a championship team that certainly lasts however long Chris Paul's window lasts, and they're hoping that he'll agree to take what he views as a discount and what they they view as an investment in success and winning and continuing to grow into a very, very good player for a young guy who has the opportunity, if he's really good going forward, to get another big-time contract at some point. Yeah, I agree with Bill. I, I think that the Suns certainly want to move forward with Aiton uh, next to their other host of tremendous players, and they think they can compete for championships. Uh, but, I, you know, I think they proved last season when they brought in Bismack Biombo, uh, when they had JaVale McGee starting for certain periods when DeAndre Aiton was out, if Chris Paul is at his peak, he can take almost any center and turn them into a viable center offensively. Uh, as long as they're a lob threat, as long as they have decent enough hands to catch the ball, uh, Chris Paul has proven that he can take a center 
and make them, you know, into a starting caliber center on a team like the Phoenix Suns. So if they're not willing to pay DeAndre Ayton the max, if he gets a max offer sheet, or if Ayton is just says, you know what, I am done with this organization. I think, uh, you know, as Bill mentioned, there's some free agent center options. And I think that given the construction of that team, I don't think they necessarily need a center who's going to be uh, offensively aggressive. I think they need someone who can play defense, protect the rim, and catch lobs from Chris Paul. So I think moving forward, that's the kind of what they're going to have to weigh uh, if they want to pay Aiton to come back or whether they think, hey, look, we can get by with kind of an average level NBA starter given the rest of our roster. Free agency beginning in about three weeks, June the 30th. And one name that is going to be up for grabs is unrestricted free agent Zach Levine, who Colin is still young. He has shown that he can be a prolific scorer. What would be Zach Levine's best fit? Well, Zach Levine, you know, the world is his oyster. Uh, he's going to have a lot of options out there. Uh, you know, Dallas is an intriguing one for me, just seeing him next to Luka Doncic and what's that, what that would look like. Uh, but to me, I think uh, it's the simple answer. It's go back to the Bulls. Uh, this team was doing really, really well earlier in the year before they were just hammered by injuries. Uh, the lineup of Levine, Lonzo Ball, Vucevic, DeMar DeRozan, Alex Caruso had a plus 12.5 net rating. Uh, they were absolutely destroying people, obviously limited minutes because of the injuries. But I think there is certainly enough there for Zach Levine to think, hey, look, I can go back to this team and we can be a cha championship contender, if not next season, maybe the season after that. Add in the fact that obviously the Bulls can pay him more money. Uh, and I think it's kind of a no brainer to go back to Chicago at this point for Zach Levine. Yeah, I, I co sign everything Colin just said, and I agree with everything he said. But, but I can tell you, and I know Colin knows this too, that there's certainly optimism around the. I think this is the most interesting free agency question, guys, in this free agency class of the guys that we think are going to be available. What Zach Levine is going to do? They have some optimism in Portland that you, they can make a run at him. They have some optimism in San Antonio, they can make a run at him. They have some optimism in LA, they can make a run at him. I don't know what they're drinking in LA, but they do think that they don't have the space. I got rid of Westbrook. Because Zach Levine, uh, and they build. Built, as Colin walked us through, the Bulls built their team, their, their present, which is promising in their future, which is really encouraging around the idea Zach Levine was going to stick around. But at the end of the year, in the last few weeks, some of his comments, some of the things that he said publicly, and as I understand it, some of the things that he said privately have raised serious concerns in Chicago and, again, have gotten other folks motivated around the NBA. It's almost like you're, you have a girlfriend and, and you feel like you're in a really good place and, and she's going on a little you know, two-week two vacation. You don't want at the airport and the goodbye for her to say how much she's loved your time together and whatever happens, it's been great and whatever the future holds, you've always had these memories. And that's what, in effect, Zach Levine has been saying about his time in Chicago. I'm with Colin. He should stay with the Bulls. I'd like to see him in Chicago, but it sounds like he's going to test the market. He's open to the idea of going somewhere else. And like Colin said, of all those options, I think Dallas is the realistic one. I think as a player, to play with Luka Doncic would be exhilarating. And I think in terms of the ceiling that you can create, you're not going to recreate what you have, the opportunity in Chicago. I think Dallas, if he wants to leave, is really fascinating. And Dallas so close to breaking through this season, close to the NBA Finals. They've got the superstar Luka Doncic. That would make Dallas even more intriguing as they look for another superstar to put alongside Luka because Kristaps Porzingis did not work out. Let's move on to Kyrie Irving, who has that superstar with him, and Kevin Durant in Brooklyn. Durant still under contract. Kyrie likely to re-sign with the Nets. At least that's the latest report. He's got that player option. What are you hearing about him, Bill? Yeah, that is what I'm hearing, that, that the, the Nets, who, who have been very vocal the last few weeks, have talked pretty openly. Sean Marks, who runs basketball operations, has said, we want guys who want to be here. We want guys who are available. We want guys who want to be team players. That is not a general statement about what they want. That is a pointed statement at Kyrie Irving. And the reason they say that, and they can say that, is because they feel like they have some leverage. Is Kyrie Irving still massively talented and highly valued by some teams and GMs out there? Yes, but that's been diminished somewhat by the theatrics away from the court. And the other reality, guys, if you look at contending basketball teams and or teams that are just in markets where you'd presume Kyrie Irving wants to go and live and play, he's very particular, that's fine. They have point guards most of those places. They have options in terms of what Kyrie Irving does. It doesn't seem likely Kyrie Irving is going to be beating a path to Detroit or to Portland or to the Spurs who have the room and the cap space and maybe the ambition to go after him. So I think they, what I'm hearing is I think they will resign Kyrie Irving. There's a sense in that organization that they can get him for less than what the max would be, that he will not opt into that player option of around four 
47 million and maybe there's a, a shorter deal three years perhaps that can be done in the 25 to 35 million dollar range but as with all things Kyrie Irving the folks that I've talked to and I would presume the people in charge uh, in Brooklyn are aware you can think you have your arms around, around Kyrie where his head at what he's going to do if he's going to show up for work and, and you can be mistaken so it sounds like he'll be back in Brooklyn guys but it's Kyrie Irving and it literally is anyone's guess until it's done. Yeah, this is the guy who went out and told Boston fans that he was coming back and then decided to go to Brooklyn. So we never know what Kyrie Irving is going to do. Uh, for him, I think going back to Brooklyn makes the most sense because, you know, there have been reports that, that the trade market for Kyrie is basically zero. Nobody wants this guy because nobody knows what he's going to do, whether he's going to show up and play, uh, what kind of problems he's going to cause in the locker room. So as talented as he is on the floor, uh, I, I don't know if there's really going to be a team out there that says, hey, I really want to bring Kyrie Irving into the mix and, and take this franchise to the next level. Uh, and for the Nets, they're kind of, you know, in a bind here because Kevin Durant came to Brooklyn to play with Kyrie Irving. And clearly, you know, he feels that, that he's one of his best options to get back to the NBA Finals and win another title. Uh, so the, the Nets don't really have a lot of options. I think, you know, as Bill was mentioning, uh, if Kyrie would opt into that player option, that would probably be uh, their Brooklyn's ideal scenario because then they could just kind of play it out for a year and see what happens. But I don't know if Kyrie's going to be comfortable doing that. So if they do have to sign him to an extension, uh, that number is going to be one of the most intriguing things that we see this offseason because uh, you can't give him a max because you just don't know what he's going to be. Uh, so seeing whether Kyrie is willing to take a little bit less uh, to make sure, uh, give them some sort of assurance that he's going to be around, he's going to be committed to this franchise. But as Bill mentioned, uh, things can change day to day with Kyrie Irving. So it's going to be really interesting to watch that develop. And if I can just add on to what Colin said earlier this year, this season, I was with an Eastern Conference GM, and he was in a pretty candid mood. Sometimes it happens, right? And they're sharing a little more than they might. So I just asked, didn't have any sort of dog in the hunt with Kyrie Irving, what he thought of Kyrie. Give me a candid assessment. And, and this person walked me, guys, through five minute, a five-minute soliloquy of all the things he thought was wrong with Kyrie, gossip I'd never heard before. It, it was borderline character assassination that was basically off the record. And he worked himself up and talked about Kyrie and all these details that may or may not be true. And when it was done, I said, oh, so, so you wouldn't sign him. You wouldn't bring him into this organization. And he looked down looked up at me, said, and used a word I can't use on CBS Sports HQ, and said, no, man, I'd, I'd bring him in. He's just, he's too talented. So that's the thing with Kyrie. Nobody wants him, but everybody's tempted by him if he looks at that organization and shows some interest. It's, it really is a catch-22. Yeah, it's a high ceiling, that's for sure, because we've seen what he can do when he has the right player by him with LeBron James and Cleveland winning a championship, and Kyrie was a huge, huge part of that. Let's move on to a team that just cannot find its way to a championship and that's the Utah Jazz a team that, that that might be completely rebuilding at this point it's just at the head coach position Quinn Snyder stepping down they're looking for a new one Bill there are reports that they have gotten trade calls for Donovan Mitchell but they don't want to hear any of those calls as of now what's going on yeah, so I, the same sources that told me that um, that Quinn Snyder would not be the head coach a few months ago told me Quinn Snyder would not be the head coach when we got to this point of the year around the NBA had no idea. And those that I've reached back out to still don't know what Danny Ainge is thinking. He's now in charge of basketball operations as it relates to, to Donovan Mitchell. The smart play, guys, and what I imagine is going on is, is that Danny wants to rebuild that entire organization. We've seen him in Boston, his ability to draft properly and make the kind of decisions that can build a winner in the long term. Give all the credit in the world to Brad Stevens and he made Odoka for the fact the Celtics are in the NBA Finals, but it's it's Danny Ainge who put that team together. But it's all well and good to, to decide you want Donovan Mitchell there and to move all the other pieces and maybe have a couple years of transition. We're in an era of player power where if Donovan Mitchell doesn't want to do that, doesn't feel like, like Ainge is his guy, or is frustrated and put out that Quinn Snyder's not there, and I have heard, and there's been several reports that that is the case, I think there's certainly a situation where we've seen this. Donovan Mitchell could just decide quietly or otherwise to try and force his, his way somewhere else. So the teams that I've talked to that have an interest in Donovan Mitchell don't know whether or not he's available. Tell me he's not available now, but are holding out hope that there might be some movement if Donovan Mitchell gets frustrated enough that he goes to Ainge and says, I don't want to be a part of whatever rebuild without Quinn Snyder you are or aren't planning so let's just pretend like he is available and the Jazz are listening Colin put together a trade proposal for Donovan Mitchell and where would he end up 
Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I got on the trade machine and, and did whatever I could do, work some magic. And to me, I think a spot that makes a lot of sense for him is the Knicks. This is a team uh, that has been talked about around Donovan Mitchell for a while, ever since Utah's kind of discontent has come up. And for the Knicks, if they're going to be able to get a player of Don Donovan Mitchell's caliber, an all NBA, you know, all star level player in his prime, uh, they're going to have to give up a lot. So I think the trade package is going to have to be centered around, you know, some three future first round picks. You could do 2023, 2025, and 2027. That's a huge haul. And then a couple of interesting young players in Emmanuel Quickly and Obi Toppin, and then some salary filler in Alec Burks and Nerlens Noel. Uh, that, that math works out. I think, you know, it seems really hefty if you're a Knicks fan, but this is a team that, you know, last season was a, a giant disappointment. They had looked like they had made some progress the season before, and then they went backwards. You're looking at that roster and saying, which one of these players is going to lead me to a championship? Maybe R.J. Barrett? Uh, maybe. So if you can get a guy like Donovan Mitchell and not have to give up a guy like Barrett, I think uh, that's something that they would certainly have to look into if Donovan Mitchell decides that he no longer wants to be in Utah. Yeah, in no secret, Donovan Mitchell would like to be a New York Knick or certainly enticed by the idea. I just, I, I'm skeptical that Danny Ainge would be willing to, to make that trade, guys, in large part because it's one thing to have Ainge come in, he's going to build a winner. It's another thing to tear down a team that has been very successful in the regular season and convince ownership, and I don't know what conversations they've had. We're going to go from that to a complete complete start over. We are not going to have any competitiveness at all. And, that, and that's what it is if you're trading for, for those picks. It, it's certainly in the realm of what's possible. I, I'm not sure personally, and I don't know how Danny Ainge evaluates those players. I, I don't know if the Knicks have enough. Uh, a, a scenario that was thrown out to me that kind of raised my eyebrows from an NBA source that I thought was interesting was Daryl Morey and, and that Sixers team because Daryl likes to go big game hunting. I know it doesn't necessarily feel like a, a fit necessarily with James Harden, but the idea that you could move on from Tobias Harris and he has some value and that he would leverage because we've seen Daryl do this before whatever he has to just pack a bunch of stars I think is interesting and, and I think the Miami Heat are a fascinating possibility they've they've got some young players we know Pat Riley even though they've done better in the draft the last few years doesn't value draft picks the way that most other organizations do now Miami Heat draft picks aren't going to be as valuable because presumably they're going to be a pretty good team whereas the Knicks probably aren't going to be so e even with Mitchell so we'll, we'll see but I you know, I think uh, again I think for the New York Knicks I think it's a really hard thing to pull off and if Donovan Mitchell becomes available He'll have a lot of say in that, but I think it has to be a massive, massive return in Utah, a, a overwhelming return for that to happen. And as of right now, uh, Utah not listening to trade offers, but as we know, there's a price for just about everybody, especially in the NBA right now, especially for a team that's looking to get over the hump and starting over with a new head coach. Fellas, stick around. We're coming right back to you in just a couple of minutes. The NBA draft is just a couple of weeks away now, and then free agency beginning three weeks from tomorrow, June the 30th, July the 1st, Vegas Summer League, mid-July, and then training camps begin in September. Do you want a sports network that delivers everything that matters about the game? The highlights, the picks, the instant analysis, no yelling, no fake debates, no politics. Hit the subscribe button and never miss a moment.